Zvezda TV channel is on the air. This is Combat Approved, and we begin this issue on board Condor, the nuclear submarine of Project 945 with the letter A. I am sure that even to the viewers of the military TV channel, this figure will not say anything. But the fact that you will hear now will surely remain in your memory forever. Neither in the USA, nor France, nor Great Britain, nor Germany, nor China, in a word no one, has ever built such submarines anywhere. Nobody but us. Why? Because if you remove this rubber coating, then we will see titanium there. So, titanium underwater technology is in combat approved right now. Titanium has been in our army for a long time. It can be found in the integral shell of attack helicopters. The frame of the world's largest flying missile carrier, Tu-160, and the backbone of the most modern Russian Su-57 fighter are made of it. The titanium alloy became the basis for the descent vehicle of the Vostok spacecraft. Titanium in aviation and space is a common practice, but the conquest of underwater space with the use of titanium is an unprecedented event. In 1961, Gagarin flew into space. In 1968, we launched our first titanium submarine. The submarine Goldfish of Project 661 immediately sets a speed record that has never been broken by anyone. Fifteen years later, the submarine Consomolets of Project 685 dives to a record depth. The main characters of our film are submarines of the third generation, the most modern among the titanium ones. They do not go for records, but they are the best for their time as years later recognized by NATO. So remember, the submarines of Project 945 Barracuda and Project 945A Condor will be the main characters of this program. They were endowed with the genes of perfect hunters, quiet, stealthy, fast. Today, we will show our titanium submarines in a way they have never been shown before, internal arrangement and weapons, living conditions on board the ship, and base protection technologies. Everyday life of submariners and autonomous campaigns of atomic titans right now in Combat Approved. Combat Approved. Any submarine base is a closed facility. When you find yourself in such places, you're amazed at the number of barriers and obstacles you have to go through before you're near the submarine. This is the Murmansk region, the Barents Sea, Araguba, Vidyevo settlement. It was here that the crew of the nuclear-powered submarine Kursk once served, and now it is the main naval station for nuclear-powered titanium submarines. As of today, there are only four such submarines in the Russian Navy. You may say, not much. However, there are no others like this on planet Earth anymore. So we keep moving toward our titanium goal, and we overcome barrier after barrier. And now, at last, we pass the last cordon. Here, you can see we are being filmed by security cameras. We are not allowed to film ourselves in this area, so we close the lens and finally reveal the cards, the pier, where two of the four main characters of our program, or rather the two heroines, the submarine Peskov and the submarine Kostroma, are located. Kostroma is the second submarine of Project 945. Nizhny Novgorod is the third in the series. She is newer than Kostroma. Well, the most perfect representative of the family we are interested in is Pskov. This is where we begin our introduction to the underwater Titan. Now we are on board the nuclear-powered titanium submarine Pskov. And here we have to introduce the commander of the division to which these titanium submarines are actually assigned. Question, do you only have titanium submarines? No, the division includes both titanium ships and steel-built ones. So you probably, like no one else, feel this difference between steel-hulled and titanium-hulled ships? Of course. 
We are well aware that the titanium hull is much stronger, lighter, and more durable. Durability is the most important feature of titanium. We have been told more than once that the working life of the titanium hull of the Barracuda, designated by the manufacturer, is 100 years. I've been wondering for a long time, is this true? We are told such a number, I don't know if it's a legend or not, they say the operational life of this hull is, as they say, a hundred years. Well, such a number, of course, has not been confirmed. But in any case, a titanium hull is much more durable than a steel-made hull. That is, if we were to remove all this rubber coating now, we'd see the titanium as it came from the factory, not even a millimeter or micron out of place? Absolutely, not at all. There are no traces of rust and stains all over the submarine's hull. It always shines, sparkles, and is ready for action. In that sense, it is a gift for the Navy. Absolutely, of course. In this regard, there is no need to fight rust. There are two main classes of submarines in the nuclear submarine fleet. The first includes strategic missile submarine cruisers, carriers of nuclear ballistic missiles. As an example, are Bore ships. The second, in football, would be called the front men. Their official designation is more restrained multi-purpose. It's like in aviation. There are strategic bombers or cargo aircraft. On the other hand, there are interceptor fighters. Our characters are rather the latter. The main task of these submarines is the fight against submarines of the potential enemy. So these are classic hunters? Yes, they are hunter and fighter submarines. We've already told you, we have a so-called animal division in the Northern Fleet. The submarines of this division received their names Tiger, Panther, Cheetah, Leopard for their vocation, to be predators. They also have a predatory name for the project, Shuka B, Pike B. So our titanium heroes are the elder brothers of these ships. They laid the foundation for the third generation of multi-purpose nuclear submarines and became the basis for the Shuka B project, with the only difference that the Pike's hulls are steel-made. Thus, from birth, the Project 945 submarines are also predators. By the way, Kostroma used to be called Crab, Skov, Okun, Perch, Nizhny Novgorod, Zubatka, Catfish. We have already seen the Perch. We are going to the Catfish. TV channel Zvezda is on the air. This is combat approved. And finally, what we have dreamed of for so long comes true. We finally dive aboard a nuclear-powered titanium submarine. And we thought for a long time about what to take with us to show you the properties of titanium. So we took a sledgehammer with us. Please take a flashlight. This is the commander of the submarine Nizhny Novgorod. Let's demonstrate. Our editorial flashlight has this unusual property. It magnetizes. But here on the titanium body, it can't magnetize under any circumstances, unlike the sledgehammer. And secondly, look around. There's no rust anywhere, because all the metal here is... Titanium. Here, every tube, every ladder, every, I don't know, lever, handle, is it just titanium? Titanium, yes. For those who do not know, the deck house and navigating bridge on all submarines are always open to seawater. In the place where we are now, there's water during the dive, but there are no signs of its presence. However, there is nothing unusual on the bridge. It is standard. It's the classics. Classics to the fullest. We move on, like Alice diving down the rabbit hole. We begin to dive into the belly of the condor. Now we will take a few steps forward and on the way to the very depths of the titanium submarine cruiser, you will see what we, at least, have not seen anywhere else on any other submarine cruisers. Nowhere and never have we seen the main entrance to a submarine pass through a floating rescue chamber, FRC. It's like entering a pleasure boat through a life raft. It's a strange feeling. After all, what is FRC? This is where the crew will gather in case of an emergency. While our titanium heroines are at the naval station, what are the submariners most afraid of? That's right, the saboteurs. 
Right now, the exercise is practicing just the scenario, when here, in the area of Vidyevo Bay, appeared, no one knows yet, a saboteur or a group of saboteurs. But it is already necessary to react to it somehow. We see a group of grenade throwers has arrived. What are we doing now? Prophylactic grenade throwing is currently in progress. We are charging the first to the area where the underwater saboteurs are located. The name of the grenade launcher is GP-61. It was specifically designed to destroy underwater saboteurs. Fire. Wow, how we were shaking right now. Right here with your feet on the pier, you can feel this blow on the water. We load the second grenade. Fire. Shoot. There. There was a double blow. First we hear with our ears, then we feel it with our feet, just like this, shaking. Yes, sir. Such a shot would either permanently disable the saboteur, or at the very least, knock him out. Interestingly, you can't feel that rumble inside the submarine. So we found ourselves inside a submarine. Where do we go first? The first thing we go to, of course, is the command control center of the submarine. Here in this place, all the control of the submarine takes place. Control of the underwater position, all the main command posts for the submarine control, the combat information and control system, control of the vertical rudder. Horizontal rudders are located here. The year of construction of Nizhny Novgorod was 1992. Despite this, much of the equipment at the command control center is still classified. From my impressions, I should note that this is not the first time we've been to a command control center, and usually the table is positioned in the direction of travel and the commander seems to move facing forward. And now you have the workplace right here. If it's not too much trouble, take your workplace. It turns out that you are sitting, relatively speaking, diagonally to... Yes, of course. It is not straight in the direction of travel, but nevertheless, this does not prevent you from controlling the submarine and performing the assigned tasks efficiently. Just for the sake of interest, sit behind the wheel, sideways to the front. It is uncomfortable. But that's because there are windows around you. There are no windows on the submarine. We take just count one, two, three, four, five, six steps and find ourselves at the entrance of the commander's cabin. I just... Yes, please, please come in. I can't. No, no, absolutely. I can't go in there without permission. Welcome to the cabin. It's very convenient when it takes you only six steps from your workplace to your place of rest. There is a workplace, there is a wardrobe. I ask the operator to turn around in the opposite direction. We can see that the commander has his shower, his restroom, which of course adds comfort. Pay attention to the posters. On them you can see the sworn enemies of submarines radar reconnaissance aircraft, anti-submarine warfare ships, research ships, foreign-made. Interestingly, we see another similar set of posters, not somewhere, but at the entrance to the commander's cabin. That is, every time the commander goes to rest, like it or not, you have to study. The underwater game of cat and mouse on nuclear submarines began in the late 1950s with the introduction of the second generation of multipurpose submarines. One of them is still in service as part of the 7th Titanium Division, already familiar to us. The name of this submarine is Daniil Moskovsky. The submarine is not titanium, but in our film we also have to show it, because the titanium boats of the third generation originate from such pike. Yes, of course, the submarine Svatoy Daniil Moskovsky, St. Daniel of Moscow, as you correctly pointed out, is the second generation. All the systems and mechanisms that are necessary to ensure the submarine underwater navigation for the search and detection of enemy submarines were practiced on it. So it's the same hunter. The same hunter. The only thing is that... The same fighter. The fighter of the previous generation. But it has one peculiarity. There are two reactors on board this submarine. Two reactors are a double margin of safety allowing you to do things that very few submarines dare to do. This submarine has twice been on combat missions to the North Pole and twice surfaced in the North Pole area. 
it was breaking through ice, and as you can see the condition of the hull, we don't see any problems. Although this submarine is made of steel, not titanium. The commander explains, with the transition to the new generation, the submarines got bigger, but the crew on them got smaller. If here, with a displacement of 7,000 tons, there are 100 people on board SKL, then on a titanium boat with a displacement of 10,000 tons, there are only 70. SKL 0.4. This is achieved through the use of new automation technologies and new control systems. To understand how our crew lives, we go down into the submarine again and continue the excursion. Choosing an atypical logic, we will walk through the submarine as if visiting a multi-story building from the bottom up, and we'll start from the ground level in a house we would say from the basement, on board a ship from the hole. Whoever has anything to do with the Navy, whether military or civilian, is well aware that potentially the dirtiest place on any ship or vessel is where? That's right, in the hold. Right now, we are perhaps in the cleanest hold on the planet. Look at it, not a bit of rust. And all this is because titanium has a high corrosion resistance. They say this hold is frequented more than anywhere else by representatives of all sorts of commissions. People just can't believe that the basement can be so clean. They envy. This is the place where you can appreciate, if you will, the full depth dimension of the submarine. I was just in the hold, now I'm going up to the third deck. There is a diesel engine that provides propulsion and electricity in case of any problems with the main atomic energy plant. Then we went up to the second deck. This is the third compartment. There is a huge gyroscope in this space. What is it for? It serves to provide a guaranteed underwater bridging to the latitude longitude, that is, provides the required grid lock. Then we come to the fourth compartment, and we see the door with the sign radioactivity, a medical airlock. What does the medical airlock mean? The medical airlock is a lock gate to prevent the spread of radioactive contamination on a submarine in the event of a radiation accident. Can we open it? Of course we can. Here's an interesting thing about this medical airlock. Dim lighting. There is a nuclear power plant further there, but we cannot go further. That's all. This is the limit for a journalist. Now, imagine that this titanium high-rise building goes out to sea, plunges underwater, and accelerates. To what speed? We are not told the exact number. They only say that it is more than 30 knots. Well, do you want to know the speed at which the Barracuda runs underwater? Now we're going to picture exactly the same speed on the water surface. We are gaining speed, now moving at 25 knots. Yes, right now? 28 knots. 30 knots, SKL. My cap is literally blowing off right now. Of course, the ship is more stable underwater. So you can walk like this? You can't walk easily now. The way we are right now, of course not. Is it possible underwater, right? Well, of course, just the feeling of this speed of 30 knots underwater, of an object of almost 10,000 tons and over 100 meters long, that's the feeling it gives, 30 knots. May I remind you that a knot is the number of nautical miles traveled in an hour. For those who do not know what a nautical mile is, it is easy to remember 1852, the year of Gogol's death. Thus, 30 knots is 55 and a half kilometers per hour. That's a lot on the water surface, let alone submarine navigation. However, we went out to sea not to race at speed, but to follow the work of the combat swimmers. What you are about to see is not an exercise. It is the real work. Systematically, almost every day, these guys go underwater. The task of the combat swimmers right here in our water area is to inspect the underwater part of the submarine hull for the laying of explosive devices. 
What do these explosive devices look like? They come in various shapes. Our combat swimmers are trained to search for such objects and, of course, are ready to clear them if they are found. We got acquainted with the work of underwater special forces in Syria. We saw how combat swimmers patrol the water area, throw grenades at the perimeter in case of a hiding saboteur. They don't use grenades here, but the guys always go underwater with machine guns. Start the dive. The guys went underwater. You will see what will happen there now with the help of cameras that we have fixed on the machine guns. Of course, there can be various underwater scenarios, but in fact, there have been no saboteurs in Vidievo, so an underwater inspection is usually just an inspection. By the way, under the water, a titanium submarine cannot be distinguished from a steel one. While the main group is working underwater here, we have a standby diver on board, I mean, a combat swimmer, and he also has a gun. Yes, all combat swimmers are armed with personal weapons. I'll ask to demonstrate a special underwater gun, the SPP-1 pistol for four special cartridges. That is, if something happens, even the standby diver is ready at any time to engage in combat in an underwater battle. Underwater combat with underwater weapons. While the combat swimmers are working underwater, we have time to have an overview of the submarine from the outside. Look at her smooth contours, and remember the phrase, semi-ellipsoid of revolution. This is the shape of the submarine's bow, which provides both a fast and low noise ship's way. Now it's time for our favorite part. Attention, there's a question. Dear viewers, we all know that a submarine does not and cannot have portholes or windows, but we see certain windows. What is it? They're not really windows. They're vents in the light hull. But when you dive, when you submarine, all these hatches automatically close and the hull is completely smooth. It becomes smooth. Yes. Now the hull of the submarine is covered with special rubber plates. On conventional steel submarines, they reduce noise and protect against corrosion. There is no corrosion on titanium boats, as we understood. The question is, why don't we stop building steel boats and switch entirely to titanium? The answer is obvious. It's expensive. And it's not even about the price of the metal, but the incredible complexity of working with it. For example, let's go to the Sevmash plant and take the simplest titanium part there. I have a high-pressure air tube in my hands. It is this air that ensures the submarine surfacing. It's scary to imagine what would happen if the welded seam on this tube bursts. So, in order to prevent this from happening, here at Sevmash, a very complex structure was built, which I would like to call a submarine. Pay attention, in order to get into this welding chamber, such bulkhead hatches are provided. Exactly like on a submarine, with a quick-acting scuttle. The welders go into this chamber as if underwater. To do this, they must climb into this airlock, and only after that, there behind my back, in the chamber, welding in an argon atmosphere will begin. These suits make the welders look more like deep-sea divers. They work in four, in shifts of four hours. It is impossible to stand it more. After that, each seam is x-rayed. Now, let's imagine that you need to weld not thin tubes for a submarine, but two thick sheets of metal, well, for example, like these. Moreover, the welding should not go along this thin, simple seam, but like this, right through the entire thickness of the sheet. What should be done for this? Electron beam welding is used. In this chamber, there is a vacuum, so we cannot get there either, but we can show the conditions in which these welders work. It looks more like a research room where scientists work. Here we can observe. What is happening now? Every time, before welding a standard product, the technological process provides for welding of control samples. And what if these two samples were welded by hand, by people, not by a machine? If such two sheets were welded by people, then it would be necessary to have two welders for two or three shifts to perform this work. 
During vacuum welding, no gases enter the weld seam, and they do not leave bubbles there. Due to this, the seam is of high quality, and this technology does not use any filler material, just the two plates of metal bonded together like plasticine. This is how centimeter by centimeter, in a vacuum, in argon, but never in the air, titanium is welded. But welding is only part of the problem. Strong and reliable titanium, in operation, is a metal with a difficult character. When we started making this film about titanium submarines, we knew well that here both the outer lightweight hull and the inner strong hull are made of titanium. Moreover, it turns out that here, on the titanium submarine, let us show you, all parts are made of titanium too. A simple example is this hatch. Please show me where are the titanium elements here. Titanium elements are practically everywhere. The hatch itself is completely titanium cast. It is made of titanium. The fasteners, the rubber seal. Are these bolts also titanium? The bolts are all titanium. Titanium springs, well, except that this element is probably not titanium. Titanium, 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 titanium. Everything is made entirely of titanium. The question is, why was it impossible to save money? Well, could the bolts be made of steel? Because corrosion starts with another metal immediately, and therefore all elements are made of titanium. As proof, the division commander shows us a metal bolt screwed to a titanium plate. It is corroded. To understand how quickly this process of destruction goes, we took three bolts with three nuts. The first one, a titanium bolt and a titanium nut. The third, a steel bolt and a steel nut. And the second one, that grim mixture a titanium bolt with a metal nut. To speed up the process, we put all three bolts in a 5% salt solution, and we turned on the heating. In the end, therefore, it is a common practice, if you station two submarines close to each other, steel and metal, then they should be stationed with special standoff blocks, buffer tanks. That is, even in this case, ordinary steel and titanium work as a cathode, anode, and in fact, yes, stronger titanium absorbs steel, destroying it. After finishing the conversation on the pier, we go back to the titanium boat, this time to Peskov. This project is not a 945, it is a 945A. Here are the updates, search and detection tools, it is one. The new reactor, it is two. Steering systems, three. Reduced noise, four, five. Updated some of the parts. We are now entering the first compartment. Think of it as the most important one. All the weapons of the submarine are concentrated here. However, for obvious reasons, we journalists are not allowed to go and examine these weapons. But we can introduce you to a man who has been in command positions on titanium submarines. How long have you served? For 12 years. 12 years. They say about this man that he has been in practically all combat situations. How does this ship behave in combat? The titanium ship is one of the best in the world, I believe, although I have served on other ships too, SKL. I will not tell the numbers of the combat stock, but the ship is capable of performing combat missions, firing torpedo, missile, and mine weapons. This is the most important thing. The peculiarity of this project is that here the number of ammunition per unit volume is almost a record. It's almost a record. We have told you more than once about the effectiveness of the Russian calibers fired from underwater in Syria. A lot of video materials, video from the Ministry of Defense. The viewer of our program is also familiar with another submarine weapon, the supersonic Onyx. But we have not yet told you about the weapons of titanium submarines. This is the Vodapah Waterfall Torpedo Missile Anti-Submarine System. Its main feature is the capacity to operate in two mediums. The Vodopod torpedo first goes in the water, then it turns on the solid fuel engines and the torpedo rockets upwards. It comes to the target by air. You can see these four eyes of the torpedo tubes. These are not really eyes or torpedo tubes. These are the breakwater shields, and there are more of them. Wait, aren't torpedoes coming out of the forepart of the ship? They come out of the forepart, but these are special shields that cover the torpedo tubes with the contours of the light hull. From the same torpedo tubes, the Titans can also shoot mines. They shoot out like torpedoes, come to designated positions, and wait for the target to come to them. Now we are approaching probably one of the most interesting and one of the most secret objects of the submarine, this stern bulb. 
They say that when the Americans first saw these devices in the stern in their photographs, no one could understand what the Russians were hiding there. What are the Russians hiding in this one? I will correct it a little. This is not a bulb, but probably it would be correct to name it a nacelle. It is a sonar nacelle, that is, a deployment and retrieval system of the sonar system antenna. That is, the submarine being underwater releases an antenna that is wound over there, and what we get, we hear everything that happens. Behind the stern, around the ship, around the submarine, a common unified field is formed. However, even without antennas, mines, and torpedoes, our Titans are capable of disabling the enemy. In Periscope. Yes, sir, in Periscope. While the Periscope is descending, we go down with it from the second deck to the first and continue the excursion around the submarine. There are cabins in this corridor. We can go into one of them. This is a junior officer's cabin, a classic setting for a nuclear submarine. Four people. Each has a curtain, his personal space, a flashlight. We leave the cabin, and by the way, here's a wash basin. Let's move on. The officer's wardroom. Look how spacious it is. On diesel submarines, of course, there is nothing like this. By the way, here is a brief historical data concerning this ship. We can see, for example, that the first firing was done in the fall of 1990. That is, the submarine was born in the worst year of our country, in the time of the collapse of the Union. Here we can see a buffet for distributing food. Thus, this whole space is a circular zone. So we come to that very periscope, the submarine commander is here. And now, attention, what do you think a submarine water cooler is? This is the so-called Rodnichok system. When the submarine goes to self-contained navigation, where does the water come from? The water comes from water desalination plants. This drinking water is used everywhere on the submarine, in the wash basin, in the shower, and even in the toilet. And this is not a very spacious, but very comfortable Finnish sauna, a characteristic feature of almost all Russian submarines sailing to the Norwegian Sea from here to the North Atlantic. And probably, it would be the favorite place of the crew of the titanium submarine on board, if not for this one here, the Cook Galley. It's a pity we don't have the opportunity to go to self-contained navigation. That's when miracles happen in the Cook Galley. However, even while in the base, the crew does not sit idle, which means that the cook does not remain without work. Now, imagine a situation. A big city, it's morning. A garbage truck is driving around the city collecting containers with garbage and squeezing it with a powerful press. Well, it turns out that exactly the same type of press, only titanium, operates on titanium submarines. We close, we start, and we flatten the cans. How does it work? It's very simple. The titanium press hydraulically compresses the cans. It is all over. Finished? It's very simple, very fast. We are opening our… and yet we are not opening it. The process of squeezing is underway, and here goes the result. Ready? And by the by, titanium submarines have plastic garbage bags. And jar after jar, we send into this little compact garbage bag. TV channel Zvezda is on the air. This is combat approved, and we continue working on board the nuclear-powered titanium submarine. We continue our excursion, now in the reverse order, moving from the stern towards the bow. This is the sixth compartment, well, let's say the last in the row. We are moving toward the fifth one. There is no longer such a multi-storied layout as there, in the bow. There are only two floors here. Here is the first deck, and the hold is below us. Exercises are going on here now. We'll tell you more about them. But for us civilians, probably the most important place in this compartment is an emergency exit outdoors. To put it bluntly, this is the main emergency escape route from a submarine. There's no such FRC here as the one at the main entrance? FRC. 
It's designed for the entire crew to come out. Here, of course, well, in a limited capacity, but it's all in principle for the last resort, designed for the entire crew to come out. By the method of free buoyancy escape, when we put on a rubber suit breathing apparatus. From what depths? To the depth at least 150 meters. In the aft compartment, there is another important rescue device, AFFSS, Submarine Air Foam Fire Smothering System. In fact, it is the main fire extinguisher for the entire submarine. Although it is located in the sixth compartment, the AFFSS must stop the fire on the entire ship. Emergency drill, fire in the first compartment. Compartment number one is on fire. Make a defense line from the stern to the forward bulkhead of the second compartment. A fire in the first compartment means that the fire can approach the missiles. It's a scary scenario. The commander decides to surface. These posts assess the safety of the surfacing course of 180 degrees. In such a situation, seconds count. A fire in a confined space instantly burns out. Oxygen, you need to go up as quickly as possible. A minute passes and the submarine takes its first breath of fresh air. We are safe now. Much can be said about the causes of the submarine's demise, but one thing is clear. They are directly related to the hard 1990s. When the Russian fleet was collapsing, when outings to sea were rare, our titanium ships have a similar fate. Their best years of youth came during the worst years of the country's life, when the Soviet Union was falling apart. But even then, they were the best, if not in the world, in the country for sure. As for the prospects and further use of these submarines, what fate awaits them? The hull of the submarine makes its operation possible for a rather long period, as we have already found out. This submarine allows for maybe not even one, but two deep upgrades due to its hull system. Our army has weapons that can be called classics. It is almost timeless. These are the Mi-8 helicopter, the Il-76 military transport aircraft, the T-72 tank, the Kalashnikov assault rifle, they are all over 50 years old, but they are still in demand. Having undergone modernization, these pieces of armament are gaining a new life. The situation is similar to our heroes. Titanium is eternal. It is not afraid of time. Well, we are not afraid of the fact that the 1990s are long behind us, that the Russian Navy is reborn, and the submarine fleet is at the forefront here. In one of the upcoming episodes, we will talk about how the underwater lines are guarded in the north. We will visit Gajevo, the submarine capital of the northern fleet, and learn how a unique operation was prepared for the simultaneous surfacing of three Russian submarines in the ice of the Arctic region.